I, you know, I have a vision for, you know, uh, bringing mindfulness to the sport. And that's, you know, especially now with the pandemic, that's, that's what the book is really about is, is looking at the mindfulness that can be created by being out on the water. I meditate every time before I fish with my clients, even, and we sit down, yeah, just, you know, just for a few minutes, just to remember that it's a gift that, you know, for us to be out there you now and, and life is precious. That was John Deach describing the essence of fly fishing. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. I'm uh, super excited to share a second podcast that we're launching that should be a huge hit. If you have an outdoor business and want to improve your online presence, head over uh, right now to outdoorsonline.co and listen to the new show uh, right now. That's outdoorsonline.co. And, uh, and check it out. Even if you don't have a uh, business or, or maybe you're not an entrepreneur, it would be really helpful if you can just click over uh, and uh, and click play um, and just listen to maybe a, a couple of minutes of it. At the launch week, it's a big a big thing having as many people. It'll help get the word out there and, and see if we can kind of get this thing moving. So uh, thanks again for that. Uh, today, John Deach, who played a key role in the movie A River Runs Through, it describes uh, a lot about the movie, some inside stuff, some great stories. Uh, John Roy... Uh, has some cool stuff today. He's got a new book coming out as well, and uh, it ties right into uh, that movie. Um, we find out a little bit about what Robert uh, Redford uh, taught him, how the shadow cast came to be, the famous mechanical fish, and um, and we also gave him get into a little swinging versus nipping on the Deschutes. So, without further ado, here's John Deach from Graced by Waters. Uh, how's it going, John? That's going great. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. This, this is going to be uh, a good time. We've we were chatting a little bit off air there on. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about the river runs through it and uh, Gary Borger. And when I had him on, I, I told him that you know we weren't going to dig into river runs through it kind of jokingly, but today we are. So are you okay, are you okay digging into some of that? Sure, you bet. Okay. Um, so before we do get into the river runs through it, you were the stump, uh, the stump man for, for the big guy for Brad Pitt. Um, can you talk about how you first got into fly fishing? Sure. I, I, uh, grew up here in Southern California and my father was a big outdoorsman and, and, and I hate to admit it, but that's how I started fishing was using salmon eggs up in the Sierra and just became really immediately i still remember you know fishing and catching my first fish by myself i can still see see the creek and you know felt the fish you know and it was like electricity going into me and uh i've never been the same since and then i went uh, back east we moved back east to greenwich connecticut and my dad took me up to the orvis fly fishing school when i was 11 or 12 and uh, that's when i started to learn to fly fish and i think it took me two or three years to catch my first fish on a fly which is funny because now I'm a guide and uh, I get people, you know, that fish the first day. Um, not always, but pretty much always. Uh, so I had a very different experience. You know, I had to really earn it. And uh, yeah, I just I've, I love the sport and uh, just have always loved it. And everywhere I went, I would find people that loved to do it. And uh, it just grew in me. I went to school in uh, Colorado, University of Colorado, was on the um, B team of the of, uh the, the ski team there hmm. and uh ended up you know there's trout there in boulder creek that i discovered and ended up skipping school probably way too many times and uh ended up being a guide when i graduated uh and up in aspen and i still guide up there now nice. 35 years later nice that's right yeah so 35 years later you're still going um and a river runs through it can you we're going to dig into some of your guiding background and some of the waters you fish but you know, for maybe for those, I mean, there's got to be some people, right? The youngsters who maybe haven't seen the movie. Could you describe that movie, what it's all about and, and what your role in it was? Yeah, it's it's a good thing for me to describe the film, because for me, it's just uh, it's it, it's something I did. And I kind of expect it. Everyone has seen it. And of course they haven't. In fact, if you're 
you know, if you're 35 years old uh, or younger, you, the, the, you know, you, you were not born yet practically. So or I think it's, yes, yeah, 22 years ago. So, um, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, 28 years ago. Yeah, 28 years ago. Um, when we, we made the film, yeah, and it came out in 93. Um, but the film itself, the story is uh, about, uh, it was written by a gentleman by the name of Norman McLean. And Norman was from uh, Missoula, Montana. And uh, the story of, it was, a, it was actually a, a novella, a Pulitzer Prize nominated novella uh, uh, that he wrote. He was a uh, English professor at the University of Chicago. And uh, he wrote this beautiful, beautiful uh, story about fishing with his brother. Uh, you know, it, in the, it's, it took place in the 20s and the 30s. The fishing is mostly done in the 30s, I believe, um, uh, late 30s, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, what we had to do is, is, you know, figure out all the – my job as the fly fishing, the fly fishing coordinator was to – I had to supervise all the fly fishing scenes. And uh, the the challenge was to take people who had never fly fished and teach them how to fly fish. Now, the, going back for a second, the movie, or I should say the the the, the story itself uh, is not, and Redford would tell me this, Robert Redford was the director. You know, it's, John, it's not a movie about fly fishing. No. <laughs> I heard that more than once. Uh, and it, it's a movie, you know, about family and it's, and, and it's really a, a, a coming of age story in a lot of ways too, uh, in terms of Norman finding out who he is as a person and his relationship, not only to his family, but specifically to his brother and his brother was, uh, arguably, um, had an addictive personality, hmm. addict, you know, addicted to fly fishing, addicted to women, addicted to gambling. And uh, at the end of the story, not to ruin it, so plug your ears and if you yep. don't want to have the, the ending ruined, but uh, his, his brother uh, is, uh, is killed, uh, is murdered, um, and it's his right hand, it's his fishing hand um, that they, that they um, I guess they cut off, uh, or they smashed, I think it was. Uh, and it, the, the point of it is that he had gotten himself into such debt yeah. That they believe that, um, I mean, I wasn't ever sure, but they believe that he was uh, murdered um, probably by you know, the, 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 the mob or the people who had lent him the money. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was, and it was, so it was very hard in the family. And I believe that, um, you know, the, the underlying essence of the film and the story that was so beautiful, my Redford was attracted to it, is that uh, Norman found this solace in. You know, in the river, uh, and I believe the solace that he found was around his grief around his brother. And in fact, it um, he went on record saying that it took him, you know, most of his life to have the courage to write, to finally sit down and write this story. And uh, you know, for me, it was very, very um, moving to sit down in a theater um, by myself and watch um, and watch the cut. Uh, uh, you know, right before it, it, you know, it was finalized mm -hmm. because, you know, I have a similar story and, and a lot of us do. People have come up to me for a long time since and have talked about, uh, it, you know, them seeing the movie and that changing their lives. Some people have said that they've moved to Montana because of it, who I've come across. Uh, but but the thing that always, uh, always was amazing was when people would come up to me and say, and they still do, you know, I lost so and so. I lost, you know, my brother, I lost my, my dad or my mom or my uncle. And when I saw that film, you know, it really brought home, you know, what, what it means to be alive. Mm. And boy, are we in a place right now, with this pandemic, where that is a needed message, you know, of, 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 uh, of what really is meaningful. And for me, what the most meaningful thing is, is, uh, you know, is the river is is being in nature and being with the ones that you love. Uh, those are the two things that are the most uh, the, the most important things. And 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 what's what's amazing is that um, amidst this darkness of what's going on with death in the, in in this time, that we have family. We're all with our families pretty much, and we have this access to nature. Although. Be honest, where I am right now, the beach is closed. Yep. The trails are closed. 
and um, and it's it's been hard on me because I've I've self diagnosed myself with nature deficit disorder, mm. and uh, and so for me it, you know for me to get that spiritual connection I, I've I've got to be into the outdoors and actually Dave I've written a book about it it's called Grace by Waters and it's mm-hmm. coming out on April twenty eighth and um, I've been working on it for seven years maybe even eight years now and it's it's basically taking that same uh, insightfulness in terms of, um, what, what are we really fishing for? You know, what is the message? What is that word it and the river runs through it? Mm. I believe it's soul. You know, it, the river runs through my soul, certainly and the people that I know that love this sport, it runs through theirs. And, uh, because of my, um, experience with loss, uh, and grief, which is actually, I would call complicated grief. That's, that's, that's a term that's often used with the kind of grief that just doesn't seem to go away. You know, it comes back in waves. And, you know, it's it's similar to maybe PTSD. And I think yeah. that Norman, if I might be so bold, had a, had a bit of that in terms of, you know, could he have helped his brother? What could he have done right. more to have helped his brother? And I think that the river in, in so many ways helped him to understand that, you know, that he just had to let go and, and let the spirit, uh, you know, let go, let God or let go, let the river um do its thing. And right. it, there's just so much we can do. And that's, I think, how we feel almost universally right now in the world with what's going on. Right. What, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but was, um, was it haunted by waters or what was the final, final? Yes. Yeah. I'm haunted by waters. What, what, what do you think, what do you think that meant to, to Norman and, or what it mean, what does it mean to you? I think that, uh, for me, I think I can only really talk about how I how I have interpreted that is, and that's really I think why I wrote the book. You know, um, let me see if I can if I can uh, explain it this way. In the process of you know reading Norman's work and working on, which I think at some point I'd love to tell you about how all the things we did in the film because that yeah. I think would really interest uh, viewers. But on the on the bigger picture. Uh, that 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 term, uh, I I am you know I am haunted by waters, has to do with the spirits that I believe he connected with when he was on the water, and when I say that, mm-hmm. what I'm really referring to is is a phrase that I I have uh, mentioned and referred to many times in in my book, Graced by Waters, and it's it's this concept that he wrote where he said you know the words. Uh, uh, under, he said, under the rocks are the words, and some of them are theirs. Hmm. And what, what, what he was referring to is the voices of our ancestors. Right. Really, you know, his brother, um, the, his father, his mother, the people who he had lost. And I get kind of emotional. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, because I think it's important that, you know, in this time that we pray for these people who are, are dying. You know, it's it's like no other time in history no. uh, that we've and, and and I think the river, you know, as Heraclitus has said, you know, uh, 500 B.C. or something, you know, uh, uh, you know, he, he talked about, you know, no man steps in the river twice because the river has changed. Yep. And so has he. Hmm. And man, have we changed and Amazing. we're changing and nothing is going to be the same. And there is no better uh, mechanism for reflection than, than a river in terms of realizing that all we have is the moment. And I do, I'll, because of my PTSD from my childhood and losing my brother when I was 10 and he was nine, he had seven heart defects Jeez. and, uh, and yeah. And, um, and he had issues with breathing, you know, he, it, he had, his lungs couldn't get the kind of oxygen that you or I can get because he was a blue baby. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah. And, and so his, so, so when this started happening, you know, I think it triggered some of my PTSD because of seeing that all these people now are, are having such a, uh, a hard time breathing. And uh, so what I'm, my point is, is that I think Norman too, and I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm assuming that that happens. You know, there, when you lose someone like that, now he was a lot older too. Of course, I was younger and that probably yeah. made a big difference, right? But so I really connected to this film and I don't, I believe that everything happens for a reason and that my work on that film, it was a team effort. Let me mm-hmm. tell you, it was a, it was a team effort to make the film. 
Um, and I'd love to talk to you about that too. Yeah. If that's something you'd be interested yeah, in. Yeah, no, I, and I, and I don't want to lose that thought because, um, you know, I think everybody, you know, when I watched it, you know, obviously I, it was a, a while ago, but, you know, I think of the things I remember, you know, again, I haven't had a lot of loss, you know, the, a lot of death and things, but I mean, the alcohol, you know, is one thing that I've, we've talked a little bit about on this, but that's something I think is pretty common for a lot of, a lot of families in, in, in this country, right? Alcoholism, alcohol problems. And I, I remember that too. Yeah. yeah and the, addiction, the whole, exactly. the whole, um, yeah, the, the opiate, uh, a crisis. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So there's all of that part of it too. But no, I appreciate you uh, shedding some light on that. I do. Yeah, I, I want to hear a little about. I mean, obviously Robert Redford. You know, you've got this iconic, this amazing person, and you worked with him. Can you just tell me what that experience was like, and maybe what you learned from from him? You know, I I I um, I still to this day would say that that was the um, most memorable project, and I've I've worked on literally uh, dozens and dozens of films and TV shows, actually more like hundreds and hundreds. Uh, but this, th this one, you know, it's, it's still what I'm known for, um, the work that I did on the film. Uh, I haven't been very um, public about it. Uh, but, uh, with this book coming out and such, uh, you know, I'm talking more about my role. Um, but, but I was hired by a gentleman by the name of Patrick Markey, uh, who was the producer of river on Road and, along with Robert Redford and Redford of course produced and directed. And I knew Patrick, um, from family friends. And when I found out that he was doing the film, I called him up and I, I went in and met with him and, uh, he, you know, I loved the story. And of course, because of the, the fact that I had lost my brother, Paul, um, you know, it, it resonated and, and I, I said, I really want to work on the film. And he said, well, we, we really have Orvis lined up to do that and they're not going to charge us. Hmm. And I said, well, that's fine. But do they know anything about filmmaking? Because at the time I, I had, uh, been a filmmaker for probably, I don't know, let's see, since I was probably my late teens. So oh, wow. about 10 years, uh, and, uh, I've been working at powder magazine, um, uh, doing their, uh, television series. Uh, and also uh, Surfer, uh, with Surfer and Powder, back in the day, uh, and and I said, hey, you know, I think if what you need is somebody who knows not just fly fishing, you need someone who knows fly fishing and storytelling and and, and filmmaking, mm -hmm. uh, and of course my claim to fame is the is the final uh, scene, the fishing scene yeah. where uh, the Brad Pitt character swims the rapid, uh, yeah. and that was a that was actually there's a story in my book about about that um, called the fly fishing oh, fly cool. fishing stunt man, yeah, and and that was uh, that was you know I think people love that scene or they hate it you know if if you're if you're a real purist about the book, what happened in that situation was Redford had me storyboard you know Jason was the actual artist um, and he was a very good artist Jason. and a beautiful caster Jason Borger yeah um, you know I, I brought Jason in initially as my assistant and. Uh, uh, and he was such a beautiful caster that he ended up doing the cast that's made the film so famous in terms of the poster. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and he, uh, so, so Jason, uh, came in and, uh, he, he was really a big help. And so was Gary in terms of, of, um, you know, uh, helping us to, to consult on and different things. And Jason was a filmmaker too, right at the time or just graduated? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think he'd done some film stuff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, so, so yeah, as, as the, as I was the department head, you know, so, so I wasn't just the, you know, just oh, a right. fishing you did it all. consultant. I was, yeah, I was, I was sort of responsible for, um, working with props, working with, um, stunts, working with, uh, uh, wardrobe. Um, one of the funnest things was, you know, helping to design the hat that he wore, um, coming up with the different, you know, I, I was the one that sort of came up the idea of using some a Wheatley fly boxes. Yep. Um, you know, you're working with the brands and we used a Fluger and then Hardy, yep. um, uh, uh, you know, and, and then figuring out how to, how to make those old silk lines, uh, work, uh, 
so we're kind of skipping around here, but it, yeah. it was really well, it was really something well, to take that and and uh, go ahead. What, what, what about <laughs> I can't leave you off without you know going into the Brad Pitt yeah. going into a little bit on the. Oh Brad. yeah, we got to hop on. We, we, we got to hop on the Brad. ADD we got to hop on the right, Brad so, Pitt thing. So so tell me. So so what was Brad Pitt? What was his? Uh, I mean, obviously he was a main main role in the movie. What was it like working with him? And and how did he? Uh, how was he as a fly caster? Well, he, he um, you know, these guys in the beginning didn't know how to fish at all. And by the way, I do want to come back to the story I was telling about, uh, you know, the, the Dana Mo of, of how we did that scene yeah. where oh, he yeah. swims the rapid and how, yep. that, how we, yeah, we'll come how back we conceptualize to that. that. Yeah. But, but in terms of, of the teaching part, you know, that was one of the things I think probably was one of the big reasons they decided to hire me was that here was someone in L.A. who um, I was in L.A. because of my my uh, my film and and. Uh, writing background and wanting to be in LA. I just moved from Aspen where I had been guiding and where I still guide. But, but at that time, uh, uh, they needed someone who could teach, uh, you know, uh, you know, the actors to, to cast. Yeah. Uh, and, and also to wade. So we went up to Malibu Creek and messed around up there a little bit. I went up there with, uh, Craig Sheffer, who was the Norman character mm -hmm. and, uh, and Paul, uh, I'm sorry, Paul, with Brad oh. Pitt. And I had to take, I had to teach Brad, you know, this is, you know, we don't have a lot of places to fly fish right here. And, you know, no. I, I live in Pacific Palisades and we, we were doing the film out of Santa Monica. That's where our production offices were. So I, I ended up taking uh, Brad uh, one day up to uh, the, uh, this little park at 26th, what was the 23rd in Wilshire. And of course that was during the drought and oh. there was no water at all in the, um, you know, in the, in the, uh, the, where they have this sort of concrete lake. Uh, and, uh, and, and so in the grass, and I'd teach them, I, and I've done this before all my life. Um, I started guiding when I was in my early twenties, but, you know, showed them how to cast, uh, you know, on, on the grass there. And, uh, it, you know, as any actor, you know, these guys really are amazing how they can emulate very quickly. You know, one of the best students I think I've ever had, just in terms of picking it up so quickly, he'd watch and he'd, he'd do. Uh, it wasn't breaking his wrist and was, you know, uh, doing the cast where he would wait behind him nicely and, and come forward, you know, and stop at two and go to 10. And, and he got all the, you know, and he was taking line out nicely. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the two, two things about that is at one point I was kind of just showing off and I was doing what Jason labeled later because, you know, Gary and, and Jason are much more scientific anglers than I am. I yeah. look at myself much more as an artist mm -hmm. uh, and a you know, creative, but um, you know, I was, I was doing a reverse cast, which I know what that is, but you know, it was this pendulum thing that, 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 uh, Jason labeled, you know, and, and that was, I was just kind of coming through and the line was coming, you know, below doing a reverse cast, which would be a pendulum and then coming forward on that reverse cast. And I was doing quite a bit of line just to show off at one point with Brad and, and Brad goes, the shadow cast, because oh. he'd read the script. Oh, really? So it was funny. I was I was not thinking shadow cast. I was just thinking I got to show Brad what I can do. <laughs> you know? There you go. And uh, you know, I was just messing around, and and that's that was how the shadow cast really you know, was was uh, was sort of created is in that moment in terms of trying to interpret what Norman said in the book. And if you read the book in terms of the cast, you know, it, it's not very specific except that he was trying to possibly create a hatch yeah. by by just you know skipping it along the water yeah and so of course in that reverse pendulum coming back and being low like that you know it could skip it through the water and i've done that you know before maybe even a, a little bit maybe not quite with that cast oh, yeah. right but certainly i've had done it to entice fish and i still do it today but, it, but the idea of creating a hatch like that, because it, it, it worked. And so it was just one of those things. And I think serendipity is so much a part of our lives. And that was serendipitous in that moment. And then sort of fast forwarding, uh, there was, you know, I, I did quite a bit of the hand work in the film in terms of the casting. Huh. I was actually um, in costume for all three actors um, throughout the film. But the casting was mainly done by uh, Jason, Nitros and Doubling, and Jerry Seen. Uh, as casters, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the who, you know, but, the but again, person? I did a lot of the uh, uh, Jerry Seen, who is the he is now the rod designer of Winston. Oh, okay. Now, now that's a great story too, because I called you know I was I had been guiding in Aspen, and I called Roy Palm, 
who is the founder of Frying Pan Anglers. And I said, Roy, I've got this great gig working with Robert Redford on A River Runs Through It. Uh, you know, who can you introduce me to up here? And uh, I'm going to get the name wrong here, but um, it was the head of Winston at the time. And uh, uh, who he put me in touch with. And he said, and, oh, you know, he said, you need to you need to contact Jerry Seam. He's the rod designer at Winston. And so I called Jerry, told him what I was up to. And here comes Jerry. He, he comes over the pass. Apparently his car broke down because he was in a beat up you know, VW. Mm -hmm. And he shows up on the dock where we would do all of our casting stuff. Um, it was convenient because it, uh, there was a there was a. Um, a, uh, a dock right on the, on the lake behind our production office. And he came out there without a fly rod. And I said, Jerry, I, I wanted to see you cast because Roy says you're like the, one of the best casters in the world. And he said, I don't need a rod. He took a full, fly, he took a fly line, full fly line. And within, I don't know, it was probably 10 seconds he was using his hands. If you've ever seen Jerry do this, no. he cast an entire fly line with his hands. That's cool. And I hired him on the spot. There you go. There you go. I'm like, you're the man. Oh, oh, and so that's, that's, awesome. that's, that's how I met Jerry Seam you know, many, many months ago. Now he is, you know, it's funny. During that summer, Winston's ownership changed hands. And uh, that's when I met David Ondaji, who's the head of Winston. What, he was ended up being on the set. And then uh, not soon after the film wrapped, uh, Jerry ended up going to Sage. And now he's the rod designer for them. Oh, gotcha. Cool, cool. Yeah, I'll try to throw in a link, a video in the show notes to somebody. I don't know if I'll have him, but somebody casting a fly. I think, I think maybe uh, there's definitely been a few people I've heard about over the years that have done that. So maybe I could throw something in the show notes. Um, well, you mentioned, let's let's go back to that stuff because that rapid scene where you're, mm -hmm. I mean, I could just describe it quickly. It's like fish on, the thing is steelhead, and it's just taken down river and, and Brad goes for a swim. And the funny thing about that is, is that, I mean, I look at my life. I've been fishing most of my life as well. And, you know, I've definitely gone for swims over the year, not quite at that level. But, you know, we if you've done it long enough, we've all been at that point where it's like you don't want to let that fish go and you'll do anything you can. Um, was that a was that a robotic fish? Well, so it, there is a scene. Yes. And there. Yes. That we, we did one. We spent three days getting one shot. And let me go. Let me go back to tell you how that came up. The 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 the, the way we designed that scene. Uh, it's funny because it's raining outside my window right now. I don't know if you can hear it, but no. uh, it was it was raining and we had a big storm come through and we shut down the set because it was an out. You know, we were shooting outside, and so I was called in. I was out scouting on the, on, uh, up up on the Gallatin, and we were shooting in in Bozeman somewhere. We were doing we were we were doing the scene where. Uh, I think it was uh, I think it was Paul that says you know uh, the farther you, the farther away you get uh, yeah know, from from, from Missoula. Missoula Montana the bigger the bigger the assholes yeah <laughs> the, whatever the word was yeah, right the, the more assholes the, the yeah, percentage the, the, increases yeah and um, uh, and uh, you know that that was something else that was hard for me because you know being from from the greater Los Angeles area it you know I, I all my life in the fly fishing business it it's kind of followed me, you know, and, and Norman didn't make any qualms about his dislike for Californians. And that's a whole other story. But but hmm. uh, it, so so they were shooting that scene and I got a call on the radio to come in. So I came in and we met in Redford's trailer. It was me and Redford and Patrick Markey and John. Uh, God, uh, John Huff, Huff, Huffman, 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 who's the the, uh, the designer and the writer, uh, Richard Friedenberg. And uh, I had spent, oh, probably three months, two and a half months uh, working with Jason and uh, scouting all the rivers and uh, storyboarding and choreographing all the fly fishing scenes. Uh, I think there was four main scenes. And uh, the, the last scene, though, I had not worked on. So I went through all the storyboards. And it was funny in my, in my book, I talk about how I, you know, cause I can be quite forgetful and, uh, uh, I'd forgotten my notes. And so it, I got my notes, everything worked out, but it came to the last scene, which he hadn't asked me to talk about or to storyboard. And he said, you know, do you have any idea for, you know, how that scene at the end could be, uh, you know, more dramatic. Mm -hmm. And I remembered a story that my friend Thomas Lockie told me about when he was fishing on the big hole and he hooked this big brown and he realized the only way to get it was to swim under this bridge. Hmm. 
And, and so I just came to me again. I just, I was like, well, how about, I mean, this is, you know, classic John Deach. I didn't really think, you know, I just started to talk through in first person, you know, about how, you know, so his character would see this fish, but he couldn't really get a good cast to it, you know, and, and he needed to get closer, you know, and he should get to the edge of this current. And I just had it just visualized, you know, I even talked about how his feet were slipping underneath and then, you know, and then he kind of reaches out and he, and it finally gets it and he hooks this big fish and it goes racing down the river. And then, and then he realizes that he either has to break it off or he has to, you know, punch into the eddy line and swim down the rapid. And I stopped and Redford said, then what? Huh. After a pause, you know, and I, and I remember going like, Oh my God, he likes it. Yeah. And I kind of, st- I started kind of freaking out in my head. Like, Cause he goes, well, and then what happens? And I, I and I was thinking to myself, I, I don't know. Just, I just, this is an idea, you know? And, and what was funny about that is that, that at the end of that, so I ended up doing that. I ended up doing that, um, uh, the stunt in that I got, actually got ha- tar- Taft Hartley into, into the union, um, because they, we, they tried to bring in a stunt man from Hollywood and it didn't look right. Redford had me the next day though. Up, he said, "You know where you do that?" And I said, "Yeah, I knew because I'd been scouting all these rivers." So we went up to this, um, you know, to this rapid that's just above Squaw Creek, and um, we had I had a rescue crew and and uh, I had a, a wetsuit. I still have pictures of that, hmm. um, you know, and, and I and I swam that rapid um, like you see in the film, and I I put uh, a weighted um, you know bottle, water bottle, sort of that. No, it's like a orange juice bottle um, at the end, so it was bent. Um, uh, and again, you have to do all this stuff because you, you know, you're, you're spending a couple hundred thousand dollars a day Yeah, and you can't actually go and catch a fish. You know, you just, you got to figure out all this stuff ahead of time. All right. Um, and that's why we would do these, these things like that. And yeah. the same with the, the mechanical fish. And so we wanted that, that, that shot where you see the fish eating the fly. Um, you know, we wanted to see a big, you know, we wanted to see a big stone fly on the top we wanted, because we shot that from the top. And then there was also. Mm-hmm. an under underwater shot we wanted to really make that you know a, a big deal so we spent three days separately shooting that with fernando the fabulous fish which was john faust fish that gary turned me on to gary borger turned me on <laughs> to because of the of the rise form videos that he, he oh, yeah. used to do and um that's how i that's how i knew gary because um i, I watched his videos and uh that's great and he was one of the early, early, um, you know, filmmakers yep. oh, in that, yeah. in that, in that genre. And, uh, so he said, yo, you got to talk to John. So, you know, Gary was very instrumental in, in, in helping us to get all this done. And, uh, and, and Jason and I spent three days with Fernando and John and then, you know, John, like the, the third morning, he shows me a picture of Polaroid of him in the bathtub with his mechanical fish. <laughs> that picture exists somewhere. I mean, he was a character. If you, if you ever go up to his place up in, I think it's Darby, um, in, um, now in, uh, that was, who was that with the mechanical fish? J- John Faust. Oh, John Faust. He, okay. Yeah. He's got, he's got, he's got a, um, he actually has a letter that I signed, um, uh, uh you know, and thanking people up, you know, that's encased with Fernando and picture of Bob and what we would call Bob, Robert Redford Bob. Oh yeah. And, 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 and so that, that was a pretty interesting part of that scene. So, so what happened in that, that day, you know, that when they told me Deach, we'd like you to do it. And I said, sure. And I got, you know, into the union, had to sign the paperwork. I, um, you know, I, I was very nervous, you know, um, and, uh, I, you know, I ended up you know, talking to Philippe Russolo he comes over and he'd done the bear and Emerald Emerald Forest. And he said in the French accent, he says, Jean, you know, I've done the bear, the Emerald Forest, and I've never killed anybody. Are you going to die? And I was like, no, I'm not going to die. He goes, good, we do it five times. Ah, well, and I thought we were going to do it once. You know, I'd done it once before with, you know, when we videotaped oh, it. Wow. And so I, so I go and I stand on this rock and, and he'd said, you know, I want you to be 10 feet in front of the camera. Of course, I was so nervous. I jump in the I jump in the rapid. This is sort of classic John Deach too, maybe. But I jump in the rapid and I and I aim right for the camera. And Philippe, of course, knew me pretty well. So I I I went through the rapid that first time, going like, oh, I nailed it, you know. Yeah. And 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 I and he, I see I, as I'm getting out, you know, I see him coming down the river, just madder than a cat, like a mountain lion cat. 
and yeah. and he just he just knew that I hadn't listened to the directions, and uh, and uh, so I kind of put was put my hat in my hands and. And actually, speaking of my hat, I had to because I'm I have way less hair than Brad. I had to put a monofilament around you know, my head. It was attached to that, and I didn't have any any kind of padding or any you know on my knees or no life preserver or anything really? like that. And uh, yeah, and I actually ended up having like a, a, a you know like a Charlie horse on my hip um, for for about three weeks. And this is why because the second time I did it. The bottle we used, the Jerry Seam, Jerry Seam put the bottle in, but he put it in into an eddy and it got stuck. Yeah. So I went down that rapid, oh, got turned it. around. The rod, I have like, I don't know, like 60 pound test. You know, it, it flies out of my hand. And that rod's probably today worth 10 grand, you know, more, even maybe more as a, as a, um, you know, a, yeah, a keepsake. Yeah, collector's item. All right. And so, so I, I ended up going, I ended up going. I get dragged into this hydraulic and I get dumped into the water. It wasn't not scripted, you know, and it was dangerous. And I'm under the water for, I don't know, a good few seconds. And then I come up and remember how I said how, how we didn't ever know how we would, you know, uh, uh, finish the scene. Yeah. We've never really talked about how to end it since that day in the trailer. Well, I ended up doing it right. Thank goodness. You know, three more times. So they had good takes. Brad Pitt did the, did the stuff inside this scene you know when i say seam i mean you know as we know as fishermen you know there's a rapid and then there's the water in between the rapid and the eddy or the, the eddy line there and so he went down the eddy line but they wouldn't let him go into the rapid like me because it was no. too dangerous but they ended up in any the edit they ended up seeing the mistake and this is what i love about life right um you know sometimes you think something is a mistake and it turns out that it's you know it's like the person not getting on the plane that they because yep. they're late and then that plane crashes right this in this situation you know, I, I did this thing that that um, you know I missed those the the first time two times I did it didn't work, but the second time going under that water they looked at it and they said you know what why don't we have it so that this is in edit why don't we have it so that it looks like he goes under the water and then we can use the shot we already shot of the two characters looking out at the you know at the river yeah. and so they went back and they shot that river if you look at it it's quite different. Now, there's that one shot of the river where you don't see anything. It's a what we call like an, you know, an establishing shot of the river of what they're seeing. It's their point of view. Actually, it would be a POV shot, right, of, of them seeing the river. And Jason went back and did some handwork to, you know, to, to enhance, uh, uh, you know, the, that scene. So actually, when you see those, the, the, the close-ups of, of those hands, that was Jason doing the pickups. That's cool. Um, when he went back. Yeah. So, so it was Brad, me and Jason sort of in that scene. And I was the one that went down and, and, uh, that was, that was I don't great... know if I risked my life, but it was, uh, I would definitely not do that. Yeah. What, what was, what made you, so that you were nervous just because it was dangerous. Is that why you were so nervous? Well, I was nervous because a, the entire office staff, because remember I'd been behind the camera the whole time. They all heard that now John's going to be in the movie. And so they all came out to see if I was going to kill myself. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and uh, and the camera's rolling, you know, and it's I don't know, yeah. that's, what do you call it? that? Was probably a million dollar shot or a hundred fifty, well, two hundred thousand dollar shot, whatever it is, you know. Well, it was well, very expensive. In fact, yeah. In fact, that's funny you say that because after I pitched that story in the trailer, you know, to, to start this whole thing out. You know, Patrick Markey, the producer, and I, we, I, I walked out with him from, from Redford's trailer. And when I got down to the bottom of the steps, he put me up against the trailer and said, don't ever use an explicative yeah. I won't uh, use here. Yeah. Don't ever do that again. And I'm like, what? He goes, you, just, you know how much that's going to cost? Right? Right. And he was not happy that I'd come up with an idea without passing it by him first as the producer. So it, you know, it's just one of those things yeah. um, in life. And uh, I've gone back there. I went back there when I was making my television series adventure guides for um, Outdoor Channel, um, and went back and uh, and checked that it checked out that section out. But we can also, I think, use our thoughts sometimes to make them, you know, uh, a nightmare. You know, yeah. depending on what it is. But I like the idea of looking of how he looked back and gave his his brother such grace. You know, and um, and really, um, he was a beautiful man, even though he was flawed, like we all are. Yeah. You know, I think there's none of us who who aren't. Uh, and I think that was what uh, Norman really was 
trying to get across is that um, you can love someone uh, in such such great language, and I'm yeah. gonna, I'm going to I'm going to butcher it, uh, but you know he, you know you can love someone uh, uh, you know perfectly even though they're imperfect, yeah. Yeah. and uh, and that I think was the was sort of the gist of of that and and, and honoring the life of his brother. And so I, I, you know, in Grace by Waters, that's sort of what I, I felt compelled to do. And, and, and I know how much he struggled because I heard and he was public about it. You know, it took him until he was in his 70s to write A River Runs Through It. And, uh, you know, he was in his 30s when uh, the, the bulk of the fishing stories took place. And so, the, 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 so, so to me, again, it's, it's, it's this looking back, you know, and, um, and you know, I think it's a, it, you know, that process, they do it in therapy, you know, you, and people with PTSD, they have them actually recreate what happened on the battlefield. Oh, and wow. It's an important part of the process. And, and what we're doing now with this grief, you know, we, you know, so many people are just not feeling, they're feeling this discomfort with this pandemic. And they're, uh, they're, uh, a, a lot of what happens, I believe, is that, you know, people don't know what it, they're not able to identify it. But it takes work. And, I, you know, Norman, I know it was hard for him to do it. And it was hard for me to, to write this book. And to, but in the end, honoring uh, those that have passed and uh, is, is something that one of the greatest achievements I think we can do as human beings. Mm-hmm. What, what, when the movie first came out, when did you know? I'm not sure how much money or success it had, but when did you know that it was, was going to be a big, a big movie? Or was it a big movie? I guess that's the first question. Was it? Well, I, I mean, there are different, there are different, um, again, I'm not a, an historian in that fact, yeah. but it, it, uh, you I know, know for, in fly me, fishing, I know in fly fishing, it, it changed. I mean, a number of people on this show have said what that was like. I remember what that was like. I mean, it, it brought in so many new people to fly fishing and. Oh yeah. It, 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 it increased and it shows how elastic the industry is. You know, that's the thing I think that that um, that, you know, and, and I think my one of my visions uh, would be that, you know, this that that in terms of the grief that we're all going to have as a nation uh, that fly fishing, you know, in nature, it's proven that nature, uh, you know, uh, nature substantially increases mental health. So anybody who goes through grief, if they learn to fly fish, yep. um, they, they are it is one of the best uh, uh, therapies for, for grief. And I'm, I'm a testament to that. That's what my book is about. I know I, I say in the book in, in Grace by Waters, you know, that if I hadn't uh, found fly fishing, I might be dead. I literally don't know that, you know, it, it saved my life. And, and, uh, uh, it's because there's something in the water. There's something about, about nature that just where we can just let go of, of that, that stuff that can happen in our heads. Yeah. And just get grounded, you know, and uh, uh, it, so you, I think you what you were you, you were talking about is what happened back then. I, I actually was in charge of working directly with all the manufacturers in the industry. And um, we 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 brought in, uh, you know, uh, people like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jerry Seam and John Bailey from uh, Dan Bailey's oh, yeah. who, who really worked. Work. He was the one who worked uh, the most with Redmond Post in the post production process. Um, uh, you know, he, again because he was from Montana, and Bob and him were more the same age. They really sort of bonded, and um, you know that that was one of the things for me being being a Californian. Uh, you know, it it it's it, it it's and it sort of followed me being being from Los Angeles and being in the fly fishing industry is tough. <laughs> You know, I mean, right. for one thing, all, all the rivers here are are encased in concrete, oh, yeah. which is another part of my book, because that sort of that, you know, I always feel like I have to get to a river, you know, and, and, and when I do get there, I'm now trying to bring it back with me. But there was a long time in my life where I would go out and I would, um, you know, I'd go to fish and then I would come, you know, and, and then I come back and be like, I, I'm, I'm missing something. So. I think that's part of what I'm seeing in the future now is is the ability of us to take something those of us who live in the city to to have an experience in nature and bring it back with us that calmness that yeah. groundedness um, you know and I I do a lot of, I do a lot of stuff out in the ocean now as a fly fisherman and 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 I also stand up paddle surf but our our beaches right now are closed as you might well know yeah. 
yep. so, you know, if not not forever, but just for, for yeah. right now. Just uh, no, that's right. Yeah, we're, it's crazy. Well, we're gonna start to wrap this up here uh, a little bit, and you know, starting it off, I guess you know, you mentioned story. Obviously, story. This is this has all been about story, and this podcast is a lot about stories, right? I mean, I, I love the stories. You've been in this, you know, you're a writer. Any tips you'd give to somebody who wants to get better at writing and, and telling stories? You know, I think I, I, I was always told to write from experience. Hmm. And um, whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you're good at, uh, you know, um, and maybe not even so good at, you know, something that you do that you can write from with authenticity. I yeah. think that's the that's the key word. And, you know, to be vulnerable. And I, and I believe, you know, this is a hard book for me. I, I, I have to say it's, um, it's hard from, it's, it's really hard to let go and, and sort of let spirit, um, you know, if, if, if people like this book, it's, it has nothing to do with me. In fact, I feel like, I, like, I, like my muse was channeling through me and there is a meditation to writing. There is a process of understanding that you need to get out of the way and channel that muse or God or spirit or the river or whatever you want to call that universality that we all, mm -hmm. we all know about, um, and really get out of the way at the same time, we got to use our brains, you know, in terms of, of the things we know. Uh, and so it's, to me, it's just doing it and doing it every day for, you know, it could even be 10 minutes, you know, uh, Julia Cameron writes, um, and I'm a big believer in the 12 step process. And you know, I think that this whole idea of recovery is, you know, especially now with what's going on, um, we, we need to let go and, and let, um, you know, a, a, a power higher than ourselves um, uh, work through us. And I'd say the best writers in Hollywood are probably from the 12 step programs here. I mean, I'd say half of the more than half the writers. And it's 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 tapping Julia Cameron, too, by the way. It's And she does this thing called. Um, um, what is her book? Um, what is the? Well, oh, you can look her up. Oh, she, go ahead. She, she had, yeah. Yeah. She, was it, uh, what What was that? The twelve step uh, program. Well, it's just you know programs like Al Anon. Oh, uh, oh yeah. Anonymous. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know they, they they all they all come from that place of spirit. That spirit is is the healer, and I believe that that process, in terms of what's happening today, you know she Julia Cameron. Uh, I, I don't know what, what program she came in through, but as a writer, that's that's where she, you know, that's the, the, as a writer and a writing teacher, she believes that we need to write every morning, you know, for and she calls it morning pages, mm -hmm. you know, so so it doesn't well, it almost doesn't matter in the beginning what you write about, you know, because what you when, once you get in touch with your muse and you start to write it, you know, it will tell you what, what needs to be written, and so I think that would be my my sort go. of suggestion is to look up Julia Cameron. Okay. Cameron. That's great. Because she's, she's amazing. That's great. Um, so we've talked, you know, a little bit about your book, anything else before we head out of here, you want to note on that book, I'll put a link in the show notes uh, and hopefully we're, this is coming out pretty close to the time when the book's also coming out. Um, where would you, where would you send people if they wanted to get it as far as, is it going to be on Amazon or where, where you, where would you want people to buy it? Well, it, 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 unfortunately, right now it's um, you know it, it's it, it's funny to be have spent all this time on a book and have it come out when I can't actually have any touch or any connection you know human connection with people in terms of doing something oh, right. at a bookstore you know it, it's yeah. it, it's speaking of grief it's it's something but but I I believe and my my publisher Savia Republic they're partnered with. Um, Simon and Schuster believe that the book needs to come out now because again, it addresses loss and, and we're going through this like never before, uh, or, or rarely before in human history. So, uh, uh, certainly in a generation or, or three generations now. So, so, uh, the book is available on Amazon. Uh, it's called graced by waters, G R A C E D. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I also hope that we can uh, support local bookstores. I think that, um, you know, you should be able to get it through your local bookstore. Yeah. We, the, the, it's, it's being distributed. Are, are uh, there still local bookstores? Well, so there's, I mean, there obviously there are local bookstores, but are there still independent I mean, bookstores? Yeah, sure. there's independent oh, bookstores. Yeah. Are there still yeah. the big, the, the Barnes and Nobles, are those still out there? Well, I mean, there's Amazon and yeah. Amazon certainly, I think Barnes and Nobles is still in business. Yeah, yes, yes still they are around. because my books, my book is there. My, yeah. They have, okay, they, they're they still have going. my book. So they'll have it. So you can get it at Barnes and Noble. Um, 
online or uh or, you know because obviously you can't i don't think i don't think the bookstores are open i'm sure they're not open because they're not no, essential because no, you can get get exactly. it online so yeah this is just such a new uh, a new way so i think what i first of all i want to say that the book that that julia cameron wrote if you're interested in writing i think it's the best way to to, to start to write is the artist's way in fact reading her book is how i came up with the idea for mine oh wow yeah, it was interesting. Um, huh. And I'm not the only one. I mean, there's she's probably been the inspiration for hundreds and hundreds of books. Uh, so I would say that. And then I would say that, you know, if, if you have a certain discomfort um, uh, around what's going on uh, and you've noticed um, a certain malaise, um, that's that's grief. Yeah. And um, although I'm not a clinical psychologist or, you know, I'm just a sober fisherman, you know, mm-hmm. um, and uh, but but I, I do know grief and I have worked a lot of, around it and written a lot about it and how it can affect someone's life. And uh, what happens a lot, even if you don't have PTSD, you know, a post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, it it when when something like this happens, it often will bring up things from the past and and that will just compound it and so you know this is this is where i think the the therapy the therapists come in is you know working with someone and talking it through is is i believe a very powerful way yeah. of of um of getting to that and and here's the thing I, I i believe that everything is is happens for a reason and i believe that this is happening for a reason I just saw a beautiful thing that Redford did today, um, and I can send it to you if you yeah. want to share it with your readers. Yeah, it's definitely. a beautiful music video. And in the beginning, he reminds us you know, that we need to stay positive, and we need to remember that the thing that is, that is, that, that is important to, to remember is that mo- our mother is nature. Yeah. The earth is our mother, and... And this is not affecting the fish. It's not affecting the trees. It's not affecting the river. It's not affecting the oceans. And in fact, and I hate to say this, but you know, throughout time, when we get, uh, when we have overpopulation as a species on the planet, things like pestilence, wars, etc., have have happened. Now, there's this idea of Gaia, which is that the 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 the, the uh, you know, the world, I think it was Richard Lovejoy, you know, came up with that, that the, the, the earth actually is almost like a being itself. And, you know, w- w- what, what I'm trying to say is I'm not saying this is a good thing that happened, no. but what we need to do is look for the good in it. Yeah. And one of those things for sure is our affinity for water as fly fishermen. And if we can get more people out there and, and look at, at the, the post pardon so to speak of of the pandemic is to get people um you know who now have been with their families who are seeing that there's probably a need to go inward we've been going outward for so long money stress power getting you know now we have an opportunity to get back that that inward uh you know uh work that can be done when we're out, out on the river that's how i see it and i'm hoping that that's going to be something that people can connect with is is uh you know, their connection to water. That's awesome. Yeah. And I guess the last thing I wanted yeah. to say is there's something called biophilia. It's actually high, a, high, a, a hypothesis um, uh, that, that, that postulates that for thousands of years we have seen nature. We have been around nature. And only for the last 100 and whatever it is, you know, 150, 200 years, have we really had all of this urban, you know, mm-hmm. uh, urbanness. And that it causes depression. Oh, so yeah. it's important that we get out. And as look, we, you and I know this as fly fishermen, and I think we all know it. And it's, I think, important that people, uh, in, in terms of the industry, I think that's something we can really uh, be looking at is helping people to get out and get into nature and learn a new sport. And uh, uh, you know, I, I hope that that's my message, I would say, Dave. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, I think uh, I totally agree. I mean, we've talked about that on past, just talking about steelhead fishing. You know, you're out in a run for hours and hours sitting there, and a lot of people have said that, mm-hmm. how it's just kind of that meditation, and you're sitting there in the water. You know, maybe there's not much going on, but you're just looking around and taking it all in. And, I, you know, I mean, that's why part of the reason I do this podcast. You know, I do this podcast because I hope, just like you said, we'll get more people into it, more people will learn about it, get good at it, and then they'll give back to um, conservation and 
you know, and part of the reason I'll put a, put a plug in there for my, the new podcast too, on the, you know, the, the new business, uh, kind of podcast I have coming and, and, you know, same thing. I, I think that the more people, that's more teachers, more people that are, are doing great things. So, so yeah, John, I think, um, this has been an amazing show. I, uh, you know, we, we could probably, uh, talk. There's a bunch of other stuff I know we didn't cover about your background and, and life. Well, and, and also about, yeah, also about how I love to, uh, spay, you know, I, I love to take my spay rod out now. Oh, there you go. So you're and, in, and I've, I've, I've fished the def- to shoots i don't know eight or nine trips now oh perfect and uh and i just love it you know and and it's uh it's very different it's very different there's a story in my book about how i you know i first when i first went up there i I wanted to nymph fish for him and uh travis johnson who's the um, world champion spay caster was was my guide and um you have to you have to read the story but you know he he said something that we actually put in our show and we got a lot of uh hate mail from it oh Roy, what was that <laughs> well he, he basically said i you know i, I he didn't want me to nymph fish while i was with yeah, him you know he's totally. like I, I look john i would rather watch <laughs> bobber go down the river than <laughs> with 50 grit sandpaper. oh well there you go now, now that's you can you can bleep all that out, right? Yeah, yeah, I can bleep it all. Well, it, <laughs> and it's funny because when you hit the Deschutes, I definitely you know I've been out there and seen the nymphers and stuff, and for steelhead especially. And you know, I mean, I'm I'm the same take on it. I think that you know the Deschutes is such a special place in swinging. You know, there's tons of places you could nymph fish for uh, for steelhead, right? There's tons of rivers that are perfect, and the Deschutes is such an amazing swinging river that it seems like if you're there, it just doesn't seem right to be nymphing for steelhead, but but uh, you know, I, I kind of understand what Travis is saying. It's taken me. It's taken me a long time. I, I had Casey Walsh give me a recommendation of where to go up in uh, up on uh, uh, British Columbia, and oh, cool. And I went up there, and those guys, all they would, that's all they did. You know, they wouldn't. They basically wouldn't let me you know, nymph for steelhead either. So I, I've, you know, I've I've learned the hard way that. The way to st- the way to fish for steelhead is with a swinging fly, and the last fish I caught was on a swinging fly, and I've yeah. caught probably, I don't know, I've probably caught I don't know a dozen, maybe a dozen and a half now on on a swing fly, and it doesn't matter. That's the thing. It's not a it's not a fish counting thing. No, it's the process. It's the most meditative aspect of fly fishing, maybe next to even more so than Tenkara. Yeah, you know it 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 is. There's something about it, and I I think I I've gone six or seven days without getting a steelhead. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that, yeah, and it does. And it, and it, um, it, it's, it's part of the, yeah. I, I love that. I love that austerity. And, and, and I, I believe that that's one of the purest forms now of, of fishing. You know, some of the research I did is, you know, in the book too, um, about, uh, about how that whole process of the swinging fly, you know, is still part of what we do. And, you know, that there was a big, big controversy between, um, the, the people who st- started to use nymphs, yeah. um, you know, in England. Like um, and it's very similar to me to this, to what's going on today. Um, certainly yeah. with, with circles like, uh, and I, I, that story in my book is called, uh, uh, uh the temple of spay. Oh, okay. The Tempo <laughs> Spay. There you go. Yeah. There you go. That's cool. I believe that That's it's, cool. yeah, it's, well, it's good stuff. Well, we'll leave, we'll leave some of this till the next time, but, uh, other than your book in the next few months, anything else, uh, we can expect coming out for you? Uh, no, just, 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 just the book. I mean, that's, 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 a that's been, a, yep. I'm starting to write, write, a, I'm starting to write my first piece of fiction about yeah. fly fishing. Where, 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 where are you, uh, where do you guide? Well, I got out of Aspen, Colorado, out of the, the St. Regis. Uh, started guiding there in 1984. Still doing it. I took a, I took a ways. I took a break for about I think 12 or 15 years, 12 or I don't know how many years, but um, there when I was really doing uh, the bulk of my filming. Uh, uh, so, but it's been nine years now that I've been uh, that I went back and started doing it. I did a show called Adventure Guides on Outdoor Channel, and I went around the world and, and uh, featured some of the best guides in the world. And I wanted to guide after that. I just, it wasn't enough for me just to be filming and, and writing about these guys. It was like, I realized I needed to be part of the, of the lifestyle again. So I got out of the uh, place called Aspen Outfitting 
up there. And uh, I spend uh, now every year, it seems more. My wife's been pretty good about it, um, about me going up there. And uh, you know, three to four months uh, cool. a year, cool. uh, starting in the late June and going through um, end of September, early October. There you go. There you go. And Have uh, you ever fished up there, Dave? In Colorado? Yeah, uh, I fished oh, the Roaring Fork or the frying pan. No, I've I've been up, I've been up there and messed around, but I never really have gone for a serious fly fishing trip. It's still it's uh, it it needs to be done. I just uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get up there. I'll have to hit you up here soon. <laughs> Absolutely, you bet, man. You, it's it's an open invitation. Yeah, yeah. yeah I I, uh, I was up there, you know, for IFTD last uh, fall, and I guess you know, if I'm back again, that might be the, a good time to to swing to swing up there but uh, yeah that's where we met actually yeah oh yeah yeah exactly that's yeah. where we met yeah i have today yeah um so yeah we'll just let you get out here and then um you know at grace it was uh graced by waters.com great grace graced by waters well the the, the website yeah that, that will be up graced by waters.com uh it would be a good place and also on in its instagram at uh graced by waters that's and right. also on Facebook at Grace by Water. That's right, Grace by Water. That's right. Yeah. All right, John. Well, hey, thanks again uh, for coming on the um, River Runs Through It. I have, uh, you know, a strong connection to it. it it's funny, I, you know, I don't know if anybody who doesn't, but I guess there's some people that maybe that don't. But, you know, I, I can't wait for the uh, part two, or maybe not part two, but just the next big. I mean, do you think we'll ever get to another big fly fishing movie, or is, was that? I it? think I think we will. You know, there's. Um, I'm actually looking at a couple of scripts right now. Oh and, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Any and, any uh, uh, any inside uh, any site you uh, insight you can provide on that? Uh, probably not at the moment. And there's I, there's three of them that I have that I'm that I'm interested in and and looking at doing some option work with a partner of mine. Yeah. So so that's that's sort of the next step for me is to yeah is to to move into that. Uh, it's you know, the fiction stuff. I I think I finally got the nonfiction out of my out of my blood with graced by waters. And uh, who knows? But um, yeah, it, it's that's sort of the next thing for for me is I I do think we need to do that. And I, I, certainly this book is not a sequel no. to the film, but there is um, it, it is a sequel in the sense of 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 the words you know under under the rocks, and some of them are theirs. This this mystical part of fishing that we all know. Um, you know, Kirk Dieter, um, who you probably know, who's the editor of uh, you know Trout Magazine. Yeah. He, he wrote a really nice thing he said um, about the book. He said, a stunningly honest and soulful work, Graced by Waters, cuts to the conscious of angling. Many of us turn to the river for solitude, yet at the same time concede that we never really feel alone on the water. John's writing helps us to understand why that is. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think that mm. that's, that, that's uh, yeah, it was a really nice that's thing awesome. that he said. And Yeah. Are and, you a... And, are you out there fly fishing besides your guiding? Do, are you more of a loner? Do you like to be out there on your own when you're fishing? I would say yes. Yeah. You know, I, I, t I like to go out with my buddies. I like to go out with my wife. Um, unfortunately, my son and my daughter aren't big fly fishing because I probably, you know, yep, try to beat much. it into their heads too much too when much. they're you, younger. You the old, uh, I, yeah. I, had, I had old Fred that was uh, Ch Charlie, <laughs> Char Charlie, who uh, took his kids out winter steelhead fishing when they were really young and, uh, on a cold boat and that was not a good thing to do <laughs> right so yeah i'm i'm better about i was a ski instructor and i I'm, I'm i think i was better about it you know i there's something addictive for me about fishing and it's in my book you know i call myself a recovering and an active fishaholic you know it, it's yeah. Yeah, there's just something about it I'm, I'm i can be really it's a very addictive sport and you either get you either get the bug or you don't it's it's unlike anything i've ever really come across yeah. maybe golf yeah. You know, uh, why do you think yeah, it's, it's just... why do you think it's such a small um you know we always talk about that you know it's a small niche. Mm -hmm. Why is it why is fly fishing struggle struggle to grow so much? Well, it's, it it I I think there's a number of things and I, that could be a whole other podcast, yeah. but it, it, it in a nutshell, you know, River Runs Through it had a huge huge swelling up of of uh of new fly fishermen yeah, that mainstream. came into the, into the industry. I think it was it was um, 200%. I think it tripled or something, right? right. It, it, two or 300%. And, and, uh, and then it quickly you know, dissipated because people felt that it was too difficult. You know, they, they wanted something. You know, I think instant gratification would be the explanation, right? It, uh, the, it, our, mm. our culture is so full of that. Yeah. And now these kids, when they're, you know, doing the, 
you know, getting the endorphins or, or right. the dopamine, you know, from from doing their video games. It's yeah. just you go out and fish, and it's like, eh, what's that? Or, or even on there. social media, getting the dopamine hits from just looking at their phones from social media stuff. Right. But I, you know, I have a vision for you know uh, bringing mindfulness to the sport, and that's you know, especially now with the pandemic, that's that's what the book is really about is is looking at the mindfulness that can be created by being out on the water. I meditate every time before I fish mm. with my clients, even. Right. And we sit down, yeah, just you know, just for a few minutes, just to remember that it's a gift that you know for us to be out there, yeah. you know, and and life is precious, and I, we're seeing this so much now. I think a lot, of, a lot of us are feeling that. A lot of us have known it for a while. It just depends on where you are in, in your consciousness. And uh, uh, I think that fly fishing, you know, some people say, well, you're you know, you're you're torturing the fish, and then you should be keeping right. them, not letting them no, go. And, no. And to me, it's, it's the process, Yeah, you know, it's not, if we're, if we're in the result and wanting that fish, yeah, you can throw a, pit, a stick of dynamite in there and they'll yeah, come right. up and, and yep. be, you know, and you just get a net and scoop them up. There's something about the artistry of what we do along with the science, along with understanding the biology of what we do. That's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a skill and an art that, that, is lifelong but it, it's not something you can you know i take clients out and they'll catch fish right and and uh you know, some of them become uh have, have, have come back to me for years and years and years and and, that, and they go around the world other ones i'll they'll come up and they'll go and they'll do it once and they'll never come back so it yeah. it's it really i don't know the answer to that except that it's um Maybe it's not such a bad thing. <laughs> no, no, you, you just remind me. I just the had a little. got so crowded after the river runs through it, you know, and I got a lot of grief. People come up and say, that movie just ruined it. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, I know. I think it's, yeah, it's one of those things. It's a fine, fine balance. So, um, okay, John, well, I could, I could chat with you forever here, but oh, I'll, I'll let you get out of here and uh, just want to thank I you really again for coming on. Thanks so much, Dave. And I look forward to staying in touch and getting out there on the river. Okay. We'll see you soon. Blessings and tight lines. So there you go. If you want to find all the links and all the show notes, uh, everything we got, just head over to wetflyswing.com slash JD. That's uh, John Deach. Um, a reminder on the new podcast, if you have just a minute, click over, uh, head over to outdoorsonline.co and uh, click the Apple um, um, Apple Podcasts button and listen to it there. Listen to a couple minutes. Uh, listen to the whole thing if you want to, but... If, uh, if you can just shoot over, just listen to a quick snippet. If that's all you got, that'd be amazing. Uh, it, would, it would really uh, really help out and mean the world to me. So I uh, just want to say thanks again for stopping by today to check out the show. Definitely looking forward to uh, catching up this soon. I hope to maybe see you on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.